morning, everybody. It's, um, it's an honor to be opening uh, the Festival of Dangerous Ideas, and thank you all very much for coming along uh, to the session today. Um, and the, um, the topic we're discussing here is that of ethical consumerism, and we're going to be questioning whether it actually does more harm uh, than good. Um, and I'm sure anyone, anyone who's opened a newspaper or turned on the TV um, or just generally gives a damn about the world has seen the numerous news articles and television programs about sweatshops and bonded labor and child labor and uh, environmental devastation and all these things that go into uh, producing the, the products that we then buy in the shops. And um, in response to that, there have obviously uh, been a very large number of books and television programs and campaigns set up which aim to change the state of affairs. Um, and the way that they seek to change them, more often than not, is by uh, reforming capitalism, by tweaking capitalism, by appealing to you know, uh, a sense of justice and ethics to the board of directors or various multinational corporations. Um, but for us uh, at Counterfire and, and um, generally on the left, it's not enough just to be suppressing uh, some of the ills of capitalism. What we want to do is to suppress capitalism itself. So, just before you begin this, uh, you know, to begin this, uh, my presentation, I'd like to say that I have no illusions in capitalism. I don't believe for a second that capitalism can be reformed. But at the same time, it's very important to look at the arguments between uh, reforming capitalism and having uh, a complete overhaul of, of the system. And um, I'd like to remember, along with Rosa Luxemburg, that um, people who argue for reform do not really choose a more tranquil, calmer, and slower road to the same goal, but a different goal. Instead of making a stand for the establishment of a new society, they take a stand for the surface modification of the old society. So um, arguing just to reform capitalism, just to you know, get, get workers paid 1p more an hour or, you know, to, to stop child labour. Um, it's not enough. Um, we need to completely overhaul um, the system. And otherwise, you can just end up arguing to sanitise the inhumane, um, which Elaine is going to be speaking a lot, a lot more about and looking at some examples of how it can go very badly wrong. Um, but at the same time, it's not the case that uh, within a revolutionary struggle for complete change, you don't get involved in, uh, in reforms and in campaigns for reforms. We're involved in trade unions, we're involved um, in, in electoral battles to get like, better, more left-wing MPs um, elected. So we do, we do engage um, in reformist campaigns, and that's very important. And it's also important because it's where you meet the people that actually like give a damn about the world and you know who genuinely want to end child labour and sweatshops and things. And as Rosa Luxemburg said, actually fighting for reforms is the best school um, for revolutionaries. So it's not the case that you just say, right, I want a revolution. I'm only going to do things. You know, I'm only going to just fight for a revolution. You have to, you know, you have to do both at the same time. Uh, they complement um, and aid each other. Um, but again, within this always has to be the understanding that capitalism cannot be reformed, uh, that multinational corporations are not our friends, they're there to make, uh, they're there to make huge profits off the back uh, of the labour that we provide. Um, and now another reason why um, consumption and campaigns that are around consumption are <clears throat> a legitimate area uh, for campaigns for us to be involved in um, it's because it can also be argued that um, the extraction of surplus takes place at the point of consumption as well as taking place at the point of production where we're creating value. Um, and there's a, few, there's a few examples of this that I'd like to, uh, that I'd just like to mention. Um, the first of these is um, within uh, monopoly, monopoly capitalism and the ability of multinational corporations to price fix. And... Um, I guess an easy way of looking at this is like thinking about like designer handbags and um, how it is that all designer handbags cost about eighteen hundred pounds to buy, and that's because you know the luxury luxury conglomerates have a, a, a monopoly over this and they're able to price fix and they're able to make people pay that kind of money. 
but it also takes place on a more like everyday level. Like these tights I'm wearing cost eleven pounds, which is, and that's just from H and M, and that's an insane amount of money for like a pair of tights. But you know, they even on a lower level, H and M, Primark, or you know, the lower level, these conglomerates also have a monopoly, and they can also charge whatever the hell they want for like basic everyday, uh, everyday items. Um, Another example is the paying of interest on debt, uh, where a hell of a lot of surplus is extracted, and you know, credit cards, mortgages, catalogues that charge you know up to forty percent APR. Um, another example, uh, which will be very familiar to people, is all these self-service machines that have suddenly appeared in in Tesco's and Sainsbury's, and even at my local library. So now my leisure time is not my leisure time. I'm now working when I'm supposed to, you know, when I'm supposed to be shopping or going to get a book out of the library because I've suddenly, you know, been turned into a uh, into a cashier for the day. Um, so yeah, so we can't, you know, so, so the extraction of surplus value does take place at the point of production, but it also can take place. Um, an additional surplus extraction can take place uh, not just when you're working, but when but when you're a consumer as well. Um, <coughs> So if we, if we accept that we should be engaging in this kind of campaign, if we should be engaging in ethical consumer campaigns or political consumer campaigns, then there comes the question, what kind of campaign should we be, being, should we be involved in? And um, you know, which kind of campaigns will take us towards our goal of a completely transformed society? And which kind of campaigns will just you know, spin us off on a completely... Uh, you know, completely like the wrong direction. And um, I, uh, well, to illustrate this point, I, I put in a couple of phone calls. <coughs> I, um, I phoned Dublin, actually. And um, I'm very pleased to say that I've actually got a special guest here who's going to tell us a bit about one of the campaigns that he's been working on. But I'm not sure if he definitely made it. So um, is, is Bono in the audience? Hi. All right. Over here. You want me down at the front? That would be great, Bono, yeah. Oh, um, my God, you don't have to stand up for me. <laughs> Should now, I stand um, here? Bono, what Bono's going to do right. is uh, read us uh, the Red Manifesto. It's uh, a sure. manifesto of uh, an organisation that All he right. set up. Is this working? Cool. All right, guys, don't worry. I'm not going to ask you for any money or anything like that, so it's a little joke I do. Uh, All things being equal, they are not. As first world consumers, we have tremendous power. What we collectively choose to buy or not to buy can change the course of life and history on this planet. Red is that simple an idea and that powerful. Now you have a choice. There are red credit cards, red phones, red shoes, red fashion brands, and no, this does not mean that they are all red in colour, although some are. If you buy a red product or sign up for a red service at no cost to you, a red company will give some of its profits to buy and distribute antiretroviral medicine to our brothers and sisters dying of AIDS in Africa. Now we believe that when consumers are offered this choice, and the products that meet their needs, they will choose red. And when they choose red over non-red, then more brands will choose to become red because it will make good business sense to do so and more lives will be saved. Now red is not a charity. It is simply a business model. You buy red stuff, we get the money, buy the pills and distribute them. They take the pills, stay alive and continue to take care of their families and contribute socially and economically in their communities. If they don't get the pills, they die. We don't want them to die. We want to give them the pills. And we can. And you can. And it's easy. All you have to do is upgrade your choice. Thank you, Bono. Thank you. So uh, that, word for word, was the Red Manifesto. <coughs> the Red Manifesto. That sounds like something Counterfire uh, should be producing, or you know, the Communist Party should be producing, but it's, it's not. 
It's uh, it's what Bono has produced in alliance with um, a series of like of U.S. politicians and giant multinational corporations: um, Armani, The Gap, uh, Motorola, um, Hewlett Packard. And as you heard from Bono, what you do is you buy you know you buy a computer, and a fraction of that cost goes um, to buying antiretroviral drugs, um, which, and which are then given you know to dying people in Africa. Um, but the there are several, really, there's several very important points about the Red Manifesto, and one of those that you'll have noticed is that a lot of that is our language. Um, a lot of that was like our ideas and our language. The Red Manifesto, you know, helping, you know, trying to change the world. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of ethical consumer and political consumer campaigns feel so compelling, because it's our ideas that have been recognised as having purchase in the world and have been you know, completely flipped over um, and being sold back to us to make huge profits uh, to, for, for multinational corporations. Um, and this is, part of a, um, this is part of a shift that's going on um, at the moment. And um, Naomi Klein summed it up very well 10 years ago in No Logo when she said um, that every company with a powerful brand is attempting to develop a relationship with consumers that resonates so completely with their sense of self. So what this is, this is our desires being sold back to us in order to make very, very large profits for Giorgio Armani, Motorola, and all the rest of them. Um, so whilst I think it is the case, and particularly over the last year, it definitely is the case that people are more aware of the struggles that are going on at the moment. Um, people care deeply about you know, human rights, animal rights, climate change, you know, fair, fair labour practices. Um, but what's happening is they're not being able to express that properly. Um, what they're getting instead is sort of product A and product B choices. Um, it also represents a shift from the charity, uh, traditional charity mo uh, model, where someone like Carnegie would just give money to charity, to a charity slash commerce model, where now the, the generation of profit is simultaneous with the donation that's going to charity, and um, and this is this is very dangerous. I mean, like with the red campaign, this is essentially multinational <coughs> corporations benefiting from the fact that people are dying from AIDS in Africa without any sort of systemic analysis about why those people are dying in Africa, or for example, People Tree or Tom's Shoes are essentially benefiting from the fact that people are starving and jobless in India and that people care about the fact that people are starving or jobless in India. So they then get to make, you know, not like millions and billions in the case of Tom's shoes out of people people caring. Um, and this uh, this strand of like philanthro capitalism was best summed up again by Giorgio Armani and he said at a red press conference he said commerce will no longer have a negative connotation. And that's the aim of most of these, uh, most of these, um, these campaigns that are led by multinational corporations. It's to disguise the fact this is the same old exploitation both of producers and of consumers, and just to give it a nice, fluffy, charity, red manifesto edge. Um, and it, so that again brings me to a very essential point that Karl Marx made, thanks. Um, which was that social reforms are never carried out by the weakness of the strong, but always by the strength of the weak. And what he was saying there is essentially like, don't rely on the rich to, uh, you know, don't expect philanthropy, don't expect change to come from above. It's not gonna come from above, it's gonna come from below and from everybody, you know, joining together and fighting for that change. And um, I'm just gonna briefly, there's loads of campaigns that have taken that message on board. And there's loads of consumer-based campaigns that have, um, that have used that idea of fighting for their rights and not expecting anything from above, but taking things from below. Um, there's the, uh, the Montgomery bus boycott um, from the civil rights era with Rosa Parks sitting down. People refused to get on the buses until buses were desegregated. There's the Harlem Housewives League who ran the Don't Buy Where You Can't Work campaign. There were the rent strikes in Glasgow and in King's Cross and in the Bronx. There was the, uh, the poll tax campaign. There was the boycott of South African goods. Um, there was the United Students Against Sweatshops who boycotted, did an uh, intercollegiate uh, boycott of, um, 
of fruit of the loom in order to get uh, decent wages with from workers in Nicaragua, and um, yeah, working very closely with trade unions in Nicaragua. And in fact, um, the word boycott, the name boycott, comes from um, a group of landless uh, peasants in in Ireland in the 1800s who went out against Captain Charles Cunningham Boycott, who was the Earl of Erne. And they refused to work with him, they refused to trade with him, and eventually he was driven from Ireland. So the final point I'd like to make, Chair, is that um, a crucial distinction must be made at all times between class-based boycotts and ethical choice campaigns run by multinational corporations. But it is my opinion that the... Um, the arena of consumption is contestable and that it's intimately linked to the question of who owns society's resources. And we've seen that this we've seen that in 2011 with the bread riots in Tunisia, the bread riots in um, Egypt, the oil riots in Nigeria and across Africa. And we saw it in the Russian Revolution, which was started by female textile workers um, go, like going up against the bread sellers and the, and the merchants and saying, you know, we demand cheaper bread. So as part of a revolutionary strategy, um, you can use reformist, uh, you can reuse reformist campaigns and you can use um, ethical choice campaigns. But as long as you're like framing them as political choice campaigns and you're not having any illusions that capitalism uh, will, will set us free or capitalism can be ethical or just. Thank you. Thank you.